and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hofdahl. And today we're talking about The Others. How are you, Meg? Good. I'm staying warm. We've had one heck of a winter. Well, I guess we all have here in the States, but we had multiple days of school canceled at the beginning of this month or the end of last month, whatever it was now. I don't even know because (laughs) my mind went a little bonkers. Yeah, I think we both went full Jack Torrance the last week um, that our kids were in school. But at least I knew that you were going through the same thing I was going through. <laughs> Misery loves company. It was uh, it was like 40 below without the wind chill or something crazy. So, yes, it's been winter. And, you know, I guess it's just run of the mill here in Minnesota. I guess I wasn't probably planning on being outdoors anyway. So what can I say? <laughs> it's true. What else is new with you, Meg? You've got your book coming out next month, right? Yeah. Um, for those of you that have read uh, the first in my Willoughby Chronicles, the, Her Dark Inheritance, um, Daughters of Darkness, the sequel comes out. So I'm excited about that. It's kind of like this new sort of pressure of a sequel, um, which, you know, I guess is apropos in sort of the world of horror. I, I can sort of understand what it might feel like to put a sequel out there and worry and wonder what people are thinking now that they have expectations so um but I'm really excited and um so far I've heard good things about it so uh yeah it's going to be available March 30th you know something I was thinking about as you were talking a lot of times movie sequels won't hold up but I feel like book sequels always do or they exceed expectations I don't know how do you feel about book sequels versus movie sequels yeah that's a good point I think that one of the the big differences is for movie sequels, I guess what happens when the first one does really well, then they fire that expensive director and they get, you know, cheaper people to make it is what I've heard happens. And that's why a lot of the sequels are bad. And maybe that's why book sequels um, are a little different because it's the same creator and um, they feel like they have a lot to prove, I guess. So maybe maybe that's why. I don't know. But yeah, I see what you're saying. Um I feel like a second book sometimes, especially like this book that I wrote, and there are many books like that. There, It's a second in like a third three-part series, and that's like a really tough bridge to sort of do, but it's also really fun and exciting. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Well, yay. So speaking of exciting things, we're talking about a movie that came out in 2001. I remember seeing it in the theater, and it's called The Others. Did you see it in the theater? Yeah, I think I remember seeing previews for it a lot because they kept playing them during Moulin Rouge um, because obviously the same star. And uh, we went and saw Moulin Rouge a couple times. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was able to see the trailer and then it was like, well, we have to see that. So yeah, um, I remember actually seeing it more than once in the theater. So it came out in 2001. It's 84% fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. It's partially based on The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. And I remember reading that story in high school and just falling in love with it. How, did you have a Turn of the Screw um, awakening? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I, I. it's one of my favorite ghost stories. It's so... Uh, female driven and and there's actually a lot of feminist aspects to it but it's it's just a very well written creepy and it and it has the same sort of sensibility as the other so I can see kind of how it was sort of inspired because there's no blood there's no guts there's no violence there's no swearing like it's very it comes from this almost like quiet horror place so I can see how how the two would be linked. I love it. Okay, this movie had a budget of $17 million. It made $209 million at the box office. Holy cow. I wonder if it was like word of mouth or what what did it? That's really, I'm surprised. I think Nicole Kidman, I mean, not that she's not bankable now, but I feel like this was really, she was at the height of her celebrity at this point. People love Nicole Kidman and I love her. Oh, I love her too. I mean, that was one of the big appeals of the movie I did notice that Tom Cruise produced it I forgot that I think this was right when they were breaking up and this was like sort of their project that their last project together I'm assuming um and maybe some of that kind of got people interested too but uh that's really cool that made so much money for like this 
you know, I want to, I keep wanting to call it Victorian because we were talking of Turn of the Screw, but it's not. It's World War II era, um, but it feels Victorian, doesn't it? It does. You know, uh, this also reminds me because of the, the beginning of the plot. It's always fun to see how the rich live, but it's the servants who end up having the best stories, don't you think? Like the upstairs, downstairs kind of thing. Ooh, like Downton Abbey. Like they get to spy on the... I, I always thought that what that would be like to be a rich person and to have like servants in your house all the time or vice versa to like be living in a rich person's house and be their servant. It's sort of a fascinating thing. And it's kind of, it's kind of interesting too, because in down, like Downton Abbey, when it kind of starts getting later into the era and it's getting closer to World War II, it was kind of like, yeah, this doesn't really, the, the world doesn't function like this anymore. So it's kind of cool to see it happening, even though, you know, it's not really the reality of most people's lives. Right. Uh, you know, and I was just rewatching Get Out yesterday because uh, I was showing it to one of my classes and the, you know, that whole, they, they have servants, but you know, there's of course more to the story, but again, it just feels a little off. It's not, it doesn't feel this century. Yeah. I mean, there's something, I, a lot of people have somebody maybe come clean their house every two weeks or something, but the idea of having like an actual servant in your house for like all day, every day, like, yeah, it's, it's kind of antiquated. And so, yeah, this, this movie, and I have to say like, so I'm kind of careful. I don't want my kids watching things too out there crazy. They they don't want to. And I watched this movie with Dexter and it's like, I have to recommend that it's like a really good movie to watch with your kid if you want to, them to get into horror. Because like I said, it's sort of this quiet horror where it's scary and there's things happening, but I never had to worry, like, there was never going to be a penis or anything. Yeah, and there's no no gruesomeness no. at all. Yeah, no, there's, like, not anything where I have to worry about, you know, somebody being eviscerated or whatever. So it was kind of, like, a nice way to watch a horror movie. And it was, <laughs> I was watching it during this whole, like, um, kids home from school for an extended period. And it, I kind of felt like Nicole came in at the beginning of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> So I love I love this and of course as with every episode spoilers abound but the progress of the creep factor for this movie first of all it's creepy that they're allergic to light and I'm and I'm sorry if you you know have this condition and you can't go in the light people but you know it's a little creepy then maybe it's creepy because she the mother is the one like Munchausen by proxy you know doing that to them and she, it's all in her mind and then you think, well, it's creepy because maybe there are ghosts and the house is haunted, but then it ups the creep factor because they are the ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> At that end, that twist ending, it was so fun watching it with a seven-year-old because he realized, well, he he didn't know what a seance was, so I think that kind of hurt him, like, sort of figuring out what was happening. But then when he was realizing it, it was so fun to, you know, there's nothing better than like watching somebody when you know the twist and you're like, Oh my God, get a load of this. And it was fun to see him like process it because it made it. It's, it's one of the best twists. I knew it was coming, but I still really enjoyed that. That's how, you know, it's a good twist. And when you know it's coming, but you still can't wait for it to happen. I agree. And I watched this movie with Vienna and she too, she loved the old creepy grandma and like, mm. why is her voice like that in the dress? And I'm like, this is terrifying. And she thought it was great. So, I mean, maybe we would have thought that too when we were five. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, if anyone had to live in a big house without sunlight, it would be me. I would do that for free. I know. <laughs> <laughs> would you prefer to have Nicole Kidman ushering you from room to room? Okay. I mean, I don't know about that part, but. <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean. Uh, listen, I love old stuff. I love old houses. I love old things. I love old books with people of dead people. I mean, pictures of dead people in them. So I think I could survive very, I'm already pale enough. Like it would be great. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. I, I think I could live this life. Oh, it's a creep, couple creepy moments. Um, the mother, she hears the crying and she's like goes and rushes and, and it's like, I wasn't crying and that's weird. And and, and scary and unsettling. But then they're ta they're sharing the story about how um, the uh, apostles or whoever denied Christ. And the kids say that they also would deny Christ 
and not believe in order to save their lives. And it's like, it's this creepy, like foreshadowing and, and almost like, wait, what is this dynamic? And she's so appalled that they would admit that. But I love that moment. That's really fascinating. You know, it's not, it's not something that really stuck in my mind, but now that you say it, it's really fascinating that she's almost like, I don't want to say hyper-religious because I think for the era and everything, she's probably pretty normal. But at the same time, there's something, there's this edge to her where it's like she seems like worried and anxious and she's um sort she is sort of stuck on the, the religion aspects of things. And the kids are kids. And of course knowing this time around that they're dead and that they must deep down know that they're dead and that that interplay with the religion is fascinating because isn't she the one who like commits the worst sin and she's the one who is the most judgmental of them. It's kind of interesting. Another mention of, of religion uh, a little bit later or, or shortly after they're talking about limbo and, it's she's saying it's only for babies who aren't baptized um but but really they're thinking about and foreshadowing that they are in limbo because they're not they're neither here nor there they're in the in between and knowing that what the ending is like these are things that I never picked up on on my first several rewatches of it but it but this time I was like oh wow th- this is a really well written script it is every you do feel like every word is carefully chosen um and it's so well acted everybody in it and it's just so you you feel yourself i mean well like i said to watch a seven-year-old who is actually into it um and it's rather bleak and quiet but it's just done so well that it's compelling for anyone and what did you think of the little kids like do you think that it that they sort of help the story along are they good actors I was surprised to see they both don't have careers acting careers now they were both totally amazing and I would watch them in anything yeah. I think they were perfect and I think they were perfect for the story too um yeah like you mentioned they were looking at the pictures of the dead bodies it's so creepy and how they would take pictures of dead bodies and they really used to do that and the other thing I know this is prevalent in some literature you can bring it you can tell us more about it but the going mad theme uh, and women specifically not feeling like we're in control or feeling like we're about to break down you know being being just one moment away from losing it and and men you know don't always necessarily get that whether in real life or in literature but but this women going mad thing and and being hysterical yeah I mean you know it it, there's this writer that I really love her name's Kate Morton and she writes um almost all I think all of her books take place during World War II and she really sort of explores what it's like to be a woman in that time because um, and rightfully so, we focus a lot on the war itself. Um, but when you think about, especially like in Europe and England, they were decimated. And I mean, there were women just left with children and estates and farms. And these were women that were never, a lot of them were never educated or never taught how to, you know, do any sort of trade um, and all of a sudden, and in, in America too, and all of a sudden, you know, there's that idea of Rosie the Riveter, but the reality is that a lot of these women um, were left without any sort of, I don't know, real way to take care of themselves, and yet they had tons of children, they had other women to take care of, and, you know, obviously there's this idea that women are more emotionally uh, fragile than men. And that's something that has been perpetuated, you know, in time memoriam. In literature, I mean, I've talked about the yellow wallpaper before as being one of my favorite stories because it's really about, you know, this woman has this this postpartum depression and it's not being taken seriously. I know, I didn't watch it, but I know there was recently, uh, I think it was Christina Ricci was in uh, the Nellie Bly story on Lifetime. And that's about women basically being put in sanatoriums because they 
cheated on their husband or because they didn't want to be married anymore. Um, so this idea that this movie sort of explores the idea of being a woman in this time as difficult as it can be to be a woman today, we have to remember what it might be like in 1945 England when your husband never comes home. It's just devastating and, and wonderful, this movie. Um, a couple creepy things that I love. The room with the sheets over everything and it's like you don't know if there's people or mannequins or what is it? It's so simple. Like, it's so... that not that just great? Like, I mean, we get so caught up in, like, CGI sometimes. But, like, something like that, if you if you shoot it well, you have the right music, you have the right everything, it's scary as fuck. Like, give me a good ghost story any day of the week mm-hmm. and it over, like, badly done CGI. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> I mean, I'd love if we get back more to this because... And and this is to what makes um independent horror like a, a fun and, and easier thing for people to do is that you can tell great horror stories without any sort of budget. <laughs> That's a good example. Another moment that is so powerful is when the kids wake up and they realize that the curtains are missing and they're freaking out because they think they're going to die. Yeah, they're screaming and at first I you almost are like, well, what? And then you're like, oh, yeah. You know, you kind of have forgotten by that point. Um, and I do wonder, I mean, I've seen things about what it might be like to live with that disease. And and I guess that's one of the bonuses of being a ghost. You don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, I, and I also like the idea that the sort of interplay of uh, you have to live with ghosts from different eras in the house. Like, that's something I don't really know if I've ever seen before. I mean, I'm sure it's probably been in something, but it's kind of fun to think about, you know, Beetlejuice, you know, they're living in that house, but, like, what it, what about the people before them and before them? So, I don't know, it's, it's sort of cool that they have to exist in this world together. It's just like the real world, like, you have to get along. <laughs> I love when they find the picture of the the servants dead like they're the three of them lined up dead together and then when they find the graves or like they're covering they're trying to cover up their graves because they don't want them to know that they're dead oh my god and then when the kids are hiding in the wardrobe and they're doing the seance oh that moment and it's like I remember the first time seeing it like when you're you're trying to figure it out and this is why I love horror so much because it it like forces you to like sort of face all these sort of realities and questions and like it just fucks with your mind in such a fun way and this is such a great example where you just have that moment where you're like holy crap I thought I went into this movie thinking one way and it's totally the other way that's what makes horror so great I just in in the reveal that she killed her children and how they revealed it in that moment and then the scene I'm gonna cry like her holding them in the hallway Mm -hmm. and just like stroking their hair oh my god so how do you feel toward her then because here's the question because she killed her children and then killed herself so how do we feel about her I mean she's the villain of the story yet they're all trapped there together for eternity so what are you gonna do and it's one of those things where it's like it's easy if we, if it had started out, if the movie had started out and they had said she killed her kids and she did this, she suffocated them and then she killed herself, we would feel a certain way, right? We'd be like, well, screw her. But because we went on this journey with her first before we found this out then we get to see her humanity. So now it's complicated. And that's what I love about it is it's complicated because like you were getting tears in your eyes thinking about like her holding on to her kids and being stuck in limbo and being ghosts together. And then you have to say, then you have to take it back a step further and go, okay, it was, it was, 
during the war, the occupation in England, things were really rough. Do we blame a woman for doing that? And then we step back further and we go, well, yeah, she killed her kids. I mean, she could have done anything. But did she have, you know, access to mental health care and all those sorts of things? So it's like all these questions about what it is to be a woman. And it's easy to just be like, well, she's a murderess. She murdered her children. But what a great way to sort of lay everything out and make us question again, like fuck with our minds. And I think, you know, what you know it's a good movie or a good story or a good TV show when it gets you thinking and talking <laughs> and feeling things that maybe you don't even want to feel. If it's just like, oh, yeah, cut and dry, I can walk away from it at the end of the day and know how I feel about it. But instead, I'm so conflicted and I love it. Yeah, I was telling you, I rewatched Hereditary the other day and I was telling you, like, I kept feeling physical reactions to it. Not just fear, that was one of them, but also others. And that and this movie does the same thing where I actually like felt a physical reaction several times. And it, I think, you know, like some people like to go on roller coasters and I hate it. But the a good horror movie, the when it can make you feel like the thrill, that's what I'm looking for. Oh, I agree. I freaking love this movie and how appropriate that we're talking about it during women in horror month because it's such a female driven story and i mean it's just top notch so read horror books by and about women and watch horror movies by and about women right yes (laughs) so let's let's rank this movie unless there's anything else you want to say first Let's rank this movie on a scale of 0 to 10. 0 being you hated it, 10 being it's a perfect movie. We need a scale. Should we use photos of dead bodies? Yeah, I think dead Victorian babies. Because it was the babies that were the worst, the kids. Oh, I have to put in this little side note here. Vienna the other day was like, I don't like the dead baby toilet paper. And I'm like, what? And she's talking about Angel Soft because it has a baby that's an angel on the package. I mean, angels are dead. (laughs) Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's that's really funny. Her (laughs) mind went there. (laughs) She's like, I don't like that dead baby toilet paper. And it is not as good as the stuff we usually buy, which is Charmin. So send me some toilet paper, Charmin. Dead, I'm gonna call it that. Every every time I see anything angel, it's gonna be dead. Like dead baby, yeah. dead person. I love it. Like dead Cupid, you yeah. know, for Valentine's Day last week. Okay, so dead Victorian babies. Um, a scale of zero to ten. How many do you give the others? I'm gonna give it nine dead Victorian babies because it was great. I loved it, I, and I got to watch it with Dexter, which was fun. It held my interest. Um, It's just a well-written and performed movie. I love it. I'm giving it 10 out of 10. I think it's perfect. I wouldn't change a thing. I think it's so amazing. It holds up. And if you have not watched it in a long time, give it a rewatch. You will not be disappointed. Until next time, we'll see you in the horror section.